I'm going to start on just introduction to pediatric radiology. This may take me two lectures to give, but uh, just an overview. There's a lot of stuff. You're going to see a lot of stuff. This is mainly for the younger residents, the first years. But uh, I'll go over each and I give the pediatric neuro, I give a pediatric chest, pediatric GI, pediatric GU. But this is just an overview. It, for the first years, we there's a term you need to know, A-L-A-R-A, -A -A, as low as reasonably achievable. We know that radiation has a, causes an increased risk of childhood acute lymphocytic leukemia from plain film studies, and there's an increased risk of fatal breast cancer from scoliosis series. The, the, you're going to learn in physics there's a, there's a st sto stochastic and a non-stochastic effect. For your, for your lens and your eye, to get a radiation-induced cataract, your lens has to get a certain amount of radiation over a lifetime before that cataract is due to radiation. But there's not that for cancer. Cancer theoretically could happen with one study. Will it happen with a chest X-ray? No. Could it theoretically happen? Yes. And the, the, the bad thing about PEDS is we know that the PEDS, their, their soft tissues are six to ten times more radiosensitive than ours. So you've got a young person that has a long life expectancy. You give them a mutation during their young adult, during the young childhood period, it has a long time to turn into a malignancy. Plus, they're already more sensitive than ours is. If you radiate a 70-year-old and you give them a mutation, they're going to die of old age before that becomes a cancer and kills them. So that's why we try to use non-radiation as, as frequently as possible. Of course, x-rays are the most commonly ordered study in the world, and that's just because it's, it's the initial exam that most people order. It's cheap. It's portable. It's quick to obtain. It does use radiation. We want to know if the patient's pregnant. Uh, this is especially true in, uh, in the trauma situation of a pelvis or a lumbar spine. Those two exams and BEs, those cause a lot of radiation to the gonads. And so if we can get by without doing it, we sure don't want to do it on a pregnant person. Uh, the ultrasound is what we love to do on peds because uh, let's say you do an ultrasound and you don't see what they need to know. You didn't hurt the patient. There was no radiation. You might have to go to an MRI or CT next, but you didn't hurt the patient. This is relatively cheap. It's more expensive than plain film, but less than the other ones. And it can be attained portable. They can bring it to the bedside. You can bring it to the unit. You can, and it's quick. Uh, CT is fantastic, but it uses a lot of radiation. One CT of the chest is equivalent to about 200 chest x-rays, two or 300 chest x-rays. So just realize that a CT is a lot of radiation, but sometimes it's necessary. If you have a, you're in a car accident, I don't care if you're first trimester pregnancy, if you were in a bad car accident, they need a CT of their pelvis because if they have pelvic fractures and they bleed, they can bleed to death. And if the mom dies, the baby dies. Uh, this is more expensive, but nowadays it is so quick. You can go head to toe in a couple, a couple of minutes. MRI is awesome because there's no radiation, but we know that in the first trimester, you're taking a little bit of risk, especially if the woman doesn't know that she's pregnant because, you know, you, you get pregnant at day 14 and you don't know until you miss your period. So you're a couple weeks pregnant before you miss your period. Well, that is a time when you're having the, the embryo has just a few cells. If you, MRI will increase your temperature. It increases the body temperature and the temperature of the cells, but in us, we're all fully, fully grown, we're fully mature, that's not gonna affect us. But if you're only a few cells, and that's all you are, you're an embryo, it could cause a miscarriage, okay? Uh, so MRI, we, we prefer not to do it in the first trimester, but if, if the, the benefit outweighs the risk, we'll do it. We don't wanna give, uh, we don't like to give gadolinium to a early uh, pregnant woman we don't like to give uh, gadolinium to a child, but if it had to be done, we would do it, but we'd prefer not to. Nuclear medicine, there are certain things that nuclear medicine is great for. You gotta realize the difference. Nuclear medicine is radiation, but it's not x-rays, it's gamma rays. And these, the majority of the nuclear medicine studies, the patient will be radioactive. It is either ingested or injected into the patient. So this radionucleotide is floating around in the patient collecting in the liver, collecting in the, the bladder, collecting in the kidneys, collecting wherever it's supposed to go. So it, it's a great study for certain things, and certain things it's not so great for. And uh, the, the high resolution detail is not good, not on nuclear medicine. CT and MRI is beautiful. MRI on the spine and the cord, oh, it's like you just cut the brain open and looked at it. Fluoroscopy is very important, but it does use radiation. We need, okay, the eye has already seen it, and Daniel's already seen it. We love to use room two. We put it on the pediatric dose, the pediatric 
barium single shot, not the barium single shot, that's the adult, the pediatric one, and we put it on pulse fluoroscopy on three frames per second. So it, when you're looking at it, it's gonna be jittery, the, the image will be jittery, but we don't need that high speed because the, the, an upper GI is not going that fast, a barium minimum is not going that fast, VCG is not going that fast, and three frames per second is a lot less radiation than continuous fluoro. So we want to use that. We'd like to collimate. You'd like to collimate. Collimate uh, lowers the radiation dose. When you magnify, that increases the radiation dose. But we sometimes you have to magnify because those little NICU babies are so small. If you don't magnify, it, you're not going to see anything because it's they're already tiny. Plain films. Uh, radio, uh, we don't use the word films anymore because we don't actually have films anymore. They're uh, images. Uh, so they're uh, radiographic images. The most commonly ordered study in the entire world is a chest x-ray. Kidney, ureter, bladder, that's what a KUB stands for. That is a supine image of the abdomen. They often will not, in, in an adult, will not include the hemidiaphragms because they're not, that's not part of the kidney, ureter, and bladder. They're looking for the kidneys, ureter, and bladder. So if you really need to see the diaphragm well, well you might want to either say center high, like if you're looking for an NG tube, or they can order a two-view abdomen because the erect view will always include the lung bases because you have to look under the diaphragm. Bone studies, including for suspected child abuse and neglect, you don't ever uh, want to use the word child abuse in an, an official report. Uh, you can call the clinician and say, I think this kid, get, this is child abuse, but you will put in there non-accidental trauma in your report. This is consistent with non-accidental trauma. The pediatricians almost always will put SCAN, suspected child abuse and neglect, that doesn't, it's not using the word child abuse because it's using the word scan. You see what I'm saying? Soft tissue neck, they'll do that. Uh, usually it's for a strider or a sore throat, or if the kid swallowed something and they're looking for a foreign body, uh, you could do it for croup or epiglottitis. We'll talk about that in a second. Shuntogram, when I was a resident, a shuntogram consisted of you put a nuclear medicine radionuclide in the port, you image the brain to see if the ventricles get uh, the activity in it, and you, you image the peritoneum to see if the peritoneum gets activity in it. That tells you that that shunt is patent, that it's not broken. Nowadays, we only do frontal line of views of the skull, frontal line of views of the neck, frontal line of views of the chest, frontal line of views of the abdomen. It will show if the, if the tube is broken or kinked, but it won't show if there's a clot inside it. If there's non-functioning, we can't tell. It's not a functional test. Uh, sometimes you can diagnose in the abdomen, you'll see uh, the shunt in the right lower quadrant, and there'll be no bowel gas, and it'll look like the bowel gas is being stretched around this big white thing. That white thing with the tube in the middle of it, that's a pseudocyst and you can diagnose that. You, then you do an ultrasound and you'll see these septations, all this fluid, and you'll see the actual VP shunt going through it, and that's a VP shunt uh, CSF pseudocyst, and the, the surgeons will take that out because that's why the shunt's not working. A scanogram, we don't do it very often, but that's for leg length discrepancy. They'll put a ruler between the legs and they'll image from the, 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 the pelvis all the way down to the feet, and you, you measure each, the femur, you measure the tip fib, you measure the total length, and it gives them an idea if they have to put a bone lengthening procedure if they have to, to how much they're going to have to lengthen it or if they want to have a prosthetic and put it in a shoe what millimeter or whatever shoe implant they need to make so that the kid is no, uh, the legs are more equal. Sinus series are rarely done uh, for the medical students, the, my PA student and for my ER. If you really suspect acute sinusitis you treat them. If you worry about chronic sinusitis CT them you got to because you're worried about the osteomeatal complex that's only, you're gonna see that on a CT. On the coronal CT, you're gonna see it. That's the part that, will, that they will do an antral window. They'll cut that part out to make it a bigger opening. The, in the old days, they used to do an antral window at the floor of the maxillary sinuses, thinking that gravity will pull all the sinus crap down. Well, there's cilia in there, and it's doing this. It's forcing all the mucus and stuff back up to go through the osteomedial complex into the middle nasal turbinant region. So that osteoid complex is what we need to see. You can also find concha bullosa, which is an aerated middle nasal uh, turbinant. If that's big, that can block the osteomedial complex. You can't see that on an x-ray. That's why if they're chronic sinusitis, you need to do a CT. There's really no more sinus series. Sometimes they do them, but you, it's really not. Croup versus epiglottitis. Croup should be a clinical diagnosis. These kids are not very sick. Low-grade fever, barking cough, should be classic. Uh, they're not that sick. Epiglottitis, the, hopefully he's not going to send epiglottitis down to us.
because that kid could die by the time he gets through with his, with his study because that is an emergency. That's when the epiglottis and the areopiglottic fold gets very thickened and it gets thicker and thicker and thicker and it'll block the airway and they will die. And at that point, you can't intubate them anymore and they'll need a trach. And so we don't like any of that happened in the radiology department. This is on the decrease, on the downslide because of the H flu vaccine, but it is on the, it, the people that get it now are more likely to be the older teenager and the young adult because they, we, they never got it. We never got it, they never got it. And they're in close contact uh, at schools and colleges so they can get it. Kind of like uh, meningitis. You got it on first years and students, little children, you, you can have a, we all have thymuses, but our thymuses are small. But little babies, that man, you'll think there's a huge heart, but it's all thymus. Uh, they can be asymmetric thymuses, as in this case. They can be a unilateral sales sign. In radiology, we have two sales signs. The thymus is a sales sign, and the anterior fat pad of the elbow is a sales sign. This is not a pneumonia. This is not atelectasis. This is the thymus. Here's the other part of the thymus. If this was you and I, we have a, a mediastinal mass. Here is a classic, beautiful bilateral sail sign. This is all thymus. Guys, if you see this outline very clearly with black air, that's pneumomediastinum. If you see this outline with black air perfectly, more than just the lung air, black air, that is pneumomediastinum. Here, whenever you have straight lines on a chest x-ray in the lungs, straight lines are fissures. And so in this case, this is the major fissure and here, you can see the right heart border and there's white behind it. You don't see the diaphragm anymore. This is right lower lobe atelectasis. If it was middle lobe atelectasis, we should have lost the heart border. We should lose this and we're not necessarily going to lose the hemidiaphragm. Right middle lobe atelectasis is best seen on the lateral view. You'll see a wedge-shaped uh, uh, opacity with the apex going to the hilum. And that's the depressed minor fissure and the, and the uh, anteriorly displaced anterior fissure, a uh, major fissure. Here, the peds, they always, for foreign bodies, kids put everything in their mouth. So they'll usually get a chest x-ray. I like that they do this. If they know there's only one foreign body, instead of, they used to get neck, chest, and abdomen all at the same time. That's a little bit more radiation because a lot of times it's stuck right here. So if they start with the chest and then the, the ER looks at it so I don't see it, then they can go to the abdomen, which is fine. That's, of course, you gotta look for it. But if they know there's only one, and, and you do the chest x-ray, you see it, you've saved the neck and you've saved the abdomen exposure. It will most commonly get caught at the thoracic inlet, at the level of the aortic knob, and at the GE junction. Those are where they're going to get caught. If they're in these locations on the chest x-ray, chances are they're not going to pass. I've seen one that was right here and it did pass. Because think about it, the kid swallowed it at home, the mom finally realized they swallowed it. They get the kid ready, they put him in the car, they drive to the hospital. That takes time. They check in, that takes time. They get seen by the doctor or the nurse and they order the chest x-ray, that takes time. Then they, they have to wait for the tech to call them, that takes time. So by the time they did it, it's not, they didn't just swallow this, it's been there for a while. A lot of times what the ER will do, they'll call the pediatricians and they'll admit the patient. And then they'll, sometimes the next morning, they'll x-ray it again to see, or six hours later, 12 hours later, see if it's passed. And if it hasn't passed, then they go and get it. They have to go get it because this can cause, they can perforate the esophagus, this can cause esophageal strictures from scarring of the esophagus, pressure necrosis, so this has to come out. The terrible things to swallow are batteries, because there's acid and all that stuff in there, and magnets. Kids are swallowing magnets now. When they swallow magnets, they usually don't get caught because they're usually small, but they get in the GI tract at different segments, and then they, att they, they attract. And so now you've got different segments of bowel getting squashed between this attractive magnets and that gets pressure necrosis, it'll perforate the bowel. That's, and it's not easy for the, them to get out. So that's a terrible thing. They'll usually get a lateral view, which you know here, first years, you know there's no way that's in the trachea because here's the tracheal air column. The trachea has C rings and the soft spot is in the back. So if this was in the trachea, it would have to be in this orientation to be within the outlines of the tracheal air column. So you know that's in the esophagus. But I can see it that, that sometimes on the lateral view, you'll see more than one. So maybe that's helpful for them They'll, that they know that there's more than one, quote, coin. This is a coin, but it could be a battery. Those watch batteries are, look like coins, and uh, usually they swallow a penny. Uh, the most common cause of respiratory stress syndrome in a, in a full-term infant is transient to kidney of the newborn. The lungs will look wet like they're in failure. You often will see pleural effusions. There's a little bit of maybe fluid in the minor, in the minor fissure here. There's little perihilar edema. 
They should have normal to increased lung volumes on transient tachypnea in the newborn. TTN means transient tachypnea, transient, because within 24 to 72 hours, this should be normal. You do repeat the chest x-ray, it should be normal. If it's not normal, that's neonatal pneumonia. The theory behind this is, uh, this is not uncommon in C-section babies. There's two theories. One is that the C-section, how many people have ever had a C-section in their spouse? They have the date. They, they, there are emergency C-sections, but most of the time, they go, I'm gonna have my baby on Monday, July, whatever. And so they don't ever go into labor. And so if they don't go into labor, they don't make epinephrine. The mother does not have an increase in epinephrine, which the baby would also have. Epinephrine stimulates the sodium potassium pump to help get rid of this fluid. So they never went into it, so they never had it. That's a big one. Another thing is the baby did not go through the birth canal, so it did not get squashed in the pelvis. So that's another theory. That used to be what they thought was the reason, but now they're more thinking more towards the epinephrine. And so I told you all about this stuff. The key is normal to increase lung volumes. Here is the most common thing we see in the NICU. These are premature infants. There's a granular lung pattern. Here's the ET2, umbilical artery catheter, umbilical venous catheter. For the first years, you cut the cord. There's a three vessel cord. There's two little eyes and one big round mouth. There's two little arteries and one big vein. If you can't remember it, remember that the umbilical artery goes in the iliac artery and there are two iliac arteries. The aorta splits into two iliac arteries. So if there's two iliac arteries, you have two umbilical arteries that go down to the iliac. And then when you look at a KUB, the cath, you'll see that little umbilical cord here, the little stump. The one that goes down is the umbilical artery catheter because it's going down into the iliac and then it's going up into the aorta. The one that goes straight up is the umbilical venous catheter. It goes to the umbilical vein, it goes to the left portal vein, it skips the left portal vein, goes to the ductus venosus, into the inferior vena cava and into the right atrium. Uh, if you, a lot of times you'll see in the liver the catheter doing this. And that meant it went in the umbilical vein, hit the left portal vein, and went into the left portal vein. Or it'll come over here and go on this side, and that's going into the right. So this is a granular lung pattern. They should have low lung volumes. But once they intubate them or put a nasal CPAP on them, that changes. They might have normal lung volumes because now they're ventilating. But if there's no ventilation, the baby was just born, there was no ventilation, they haven't ventilated it, they should be low lung volumes and a granular pattern, which is actually microatelectasis. This is surfactant deficiency disorder. It was originally called hyaline membrane disease because they, they were hyaline membranes. But they know neonatal pneumonia has hyaline membranes, hemorrhage has hyaline membranes, pulmonary edema has hyaline membranes. Uh, you can get hyaline membranes from uh, the meconium aspiration. So they get rid of that. They change it to respiratory stress syndrome. And the now it's surfactant deficiency disorder. Is, that's the name, and that's really what it is. They lack surfactant. So what they do is they give these babies surfactant, and that's to keep the alveoli that are open, open, to make sure that they're nice and smooth, can open easily. They give them end expiratory pressure, PEEP, and they give them high dose oxygen. The PEEP, the intubation, is to try to open the new ones. And once they start getting open, then the surfactant can start working on those and make those smooth and easy to open. But they have to give high dose oxygen. What's the, we don't breathe high dose oxygen. If we did, we'd be blind. The most common element in the air is nitrogen, but they have to give high-dose oxygen because a lot of their alveoli are, cl are closed, collapsed, atelectatic. So they have, to, the, the, they have to get the oxygen in the blood up. So they give them high-dose oxygen. They know that they're, they're taking a risk, but they have to. Uh, they will give uh, Lasix, a lot of times these little babies will get pulmonary edema, and that's when you start getting increasing opacity in the lung fields, that's developing edema. But that is a good enough about surfactant deficiency disorder. Just realize that, the, that the, the, they give it because they give the surfactant to keep the ones open, open, and they give the, the high dose oxygen to oxygenate the baby. They give the, the ventilation to uh, open new ones. <clears throat> when, it's been, when they've been on high dose oxygen for more than a month, more than 30 days, 28 to 30 days, the lungs now become bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which is scarring. There's going to be scarring in that lung. When they're big, they might not have much scarring, but they will have scarring. And the worst case is when they come into the emergency room, the seniors will tell you, and they're BPD, they're former preemie, there's always going to be some, you have to have that previous one to compare with, because there will always be perihilar streakiness from the scarring. And you'll say, is this acute? If you don't have a previous one, you can't tell if it's an acute pneumonia or if that's scarring. If you have the old one, you look for where the whiteness wasn't, and there it is now, then you say pneumonia. They, the key to that is low lung volumes. Meconium aspiration, high lung volumes. Transit to keep in the newborn, normal to high. RDS, effective disorder, disorder, low. 
Here is what a feeding tube looks like. The feeding tube has that big white tip. That's a weighted tip. They want peristalsis to help move it. This is a good place for it, ligamentotrites. This is the duodenal sea loot. The pancreatic head lives in here. This is the bulb region, the second portion, the third portion that goes between the, the SMA and the aorta. Two things go between the aorta and the SMA. The third portion of the duodenum and the left renal vein, that's it. This is a gastrostomy tube. This is at the same level as the bulb to the left of the spine. This is no malrotation. If it goes a little bit past, this is in the jejunum, but this is a weighted tip. But this is the stomach air. This is not a bulb air. This is not the duodenal bulb. And then look at this. You see this? You can see the inside of the wall and the outside of the wall. This is pneumoperitoneum on a, on a KUB, and there's a little subtle lucency right here. It's very difficult to identify pneumoperitoneum when there's a small amount on a KUB, but you have to look for those signs. This is called the double wall sign, regular sign. You need to look for this. If you suspect it, you go and you do a left lateral to cubitus, left side down, right side up. If the students can't remember it, if the ER physician right here can't remember it, just order a decubitus and say right side up. The reason we want right side up is because the liver is a big white thing and the abdominal wall is a big white thing and we're looking for black between two white things. Here's the stomach bubble, here's the splenic flexure. If you go right side down, left side up, you're going to look for air near this black air. How do we, we could get confused and miss it. So it, be careful because there's a, often a little thin, thin little black line and the fatter you are, the thicker it is. It's called the properitoneal fat. That is not free air. That is not free air. It's properitoneal fat. But do it left lateral decubitus on little babies. They can do cross table laterals. If you had a spinal trauma and you could not move them, you could try a cross table lateral. Here's another example of the double wall sign. You can see both sides of the wall. You should not, you should only be able to see the inside of the wall. Here I can measure the entire wall here. You should never be able to measure the wall thickness. You gotta be careful over here because you have two segments beside each other. So it looks like that's the white wall, but it's not. This is the double wall. The reason we don't see it here, the, the, the ascending colon is retroperitoneal. Here's the feeding tube. It's in the second, third portion of the duodenum. Here's the gastrostomy tube. And the guys, you gotta, when you read an ICU film, they don't take anything off the patient. Uh, a long time ago, I think the techs tried to move something off and it pulled a line out and they get in trouble. So now they don't take anything off. My joke is that if the patient was having sex, they would actually you through both of them. That's my joke. Because they don't touch anything on the patient. This is a case of pneumatosis intestinalis. You see this bowel, you see these little soap bubbles, little black circles, and look right here. There's black lines going all the way around this segment. This is pneumatosis intestinalis. In, this could be due to necrotizing enterocolitis, this could be due to ischemic bowel, this could be due to an infarcted bowel, this could be due to an infected bowel, this could be due to a vigorous colonoscopy, this, you know, this could be due to intubation, mechanical ventilation, forcing it down, this could be due to pneumomediastinum, pneumothorax that dissected down, there's many causes for that. In the NICU, it's going to be most likely necrotizing enterocolitis. But in your older people, it's probably ischemic bowel, dead, ischemic or infarcted bowel. It's not a good sign. But it could be normal. I mean, not normal. It could be benign, just like, like I said, from a pneumothorax that transects it down or a big, vigorous colonoscopy. Here's a little baby in the NICU. There's an NG tube. This is elongated bowel. This is long. These elong Babies don't have bowel segments like we do. They have little meteoric gas patterns. There's our little cube, cuboidal pattern. Elongated is not normal for a kid. This looks like, if, if this was a 50-year-old, you say he's full of sh stool. This looks like stool. Little babies don't have stool like we do. They don't have stool. Little, little uh, zero-day-olds, one-week-old babies, they have meconium. They do not have this. So if you see what looks like a bunch of bubbly stool, that's going to probably be pneumatosis intestinalis. And in the NICU, you need to call them about that because that's important because they need to stop feeding. Feeding does not cause necrotizing enterocolitis. It makes it worse. But if you don't stop feeding, the baby can die. About 40% of these kids will die. There's air here in the wall. This is elongated. The early necrotizing enterocolitis is due to hypoperfusion of the bowel. It will classically start in the right lower quadrant. The earliest sign on an x-ray, the clinician will see increased residuals in the stomach after feeding, the earliest change you're gonna see is an elongated segment of bowel. That's the earliest, that's an ileus. So focal ileus is hypoperfused, it's not working. They repeat the study in six to 10 to 12 hours and you see that same segment elongated. How often do you see peristalsis the exact same way? Astronomically rare. If you saw it, it'd be, it'd be very, so that tells you that's ileus. That's an ileus because it hasn't changed. That's not good that bowels don't change. Then it starts getting bigger, dilated. 
And what can happen is you can get micro cracks in the mucosa or just so thin that the air and the bacteria can get in the wall and then it starts making air, pneumatosis intestinalis. Then your superior mesenteric vein and inferior mesenteric vein drain the bowel. That joins up with the splenic vein to make the portal vein. Then you start getting portal venous gas. You'll see branching black lines in the liver. When I was a resident, that, that was a sign of impending death, but it's not. Uh, then if it gets too big, it can perforate. The surgeon will operate when it perforates or when they think the baby's septic. I've seen something, a case like this, they cut the baby open, they'll do it right there in the NICU. They'll put a little, like a little, those things that, not drapes, I don't have drapes, but it's kind of a drape, but it's on that movable drape, you know what I mean? They'll put it around there to kind of wall it off, and they cut this little baby open, every segment of bowel was dead, close it back out, the baby died. So necrotizing enterocolitis is not uncommon, and it's, it, it, it could be due to poor hand washing, uh, the hygiene things. Here is something, we got a baby, is rotated, brand new baby, zero day old. This is not on the patient, this is out, this is bowel. If the bowel is outside the abdomen and it's, there's no sac around it, that's called gastroschisis. The one that has a membrane and this midline is called an emphalocele. First years, would you rather, hopefully your babies have normal, but if you had to have one, which one would you rather have, gastroschisis or emphalocele? You'd want gastroschisis. Emphalocele has up to 75% chromosomal abnormalities. They have many congenital heart defects. They have all kinds of abnormalities. Gastroschisis is usually going to have atresias, bowel atresias, and malrotation, and that's usually it. So this, you, it's opposite students. It's opposite what you think. You think, oh, I want a sac covering my, my bowel and my stomach and my liver. That's not good. An emphalocele is a big central abdominal wall defect covered by a membrane, the cord inserts into that membrane. There's often stomach, liver, bowel, everything in there. That is the worst one. The gastroschisis is a small defect, usually to the right, more, much more so than the left. It's not midline. The cord inserts normally. It's usually bowel that's hanging out. No covering membrane. That's the one you'd rather have. And before the literature said gastroschisis is much more common than emphalocele. The last time I looked at it, it's, they say kind of 50-50. But I've seen so many more gastroschisis here at LSU than I have in Valoceles. In fact, the, the, one of the nurses, the nurse practitioner, just told me that there's another uh, gastroschisis coming in a couple months. Here, I, when you read out with me, I'll go square box. Even though they're rectangles, I'll go square, 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 square. Uh-oh. What is happening right here? Here's a, like a butterfly vertebrae. Here is like half of the vertebrae is gone. Here's half of it. The other half's not. These are vertebral. And then look up here, vertebral anomalies. When you see this, you call the pediatrician, you say they're vertebral anomalies, they're gonna think vactral syndrome. Vertebral anomalies, anal atresia, so they're gonna put their finger in their butt, make sure there's an anus. A lot of times there won't be. Baby should have a bowel movement within the first 24 hours of life. If there's not, something's wrong. C is cardiac, they're gonna do an echo to look for congenital heart defects. TE is TE fistula. This is an endotracheal tube, this is an NG tube. They put it in, didn't go anywhere. Put another one in, didn't go anywhere. This thing stays right here. This is a TE fistula. The most common TE fistula is when the upper pouch ends blindly and the lower pouch attaches to the trachea. That's why you'll have air in the, in the abdomen because the trachea connects to the lower esophagus. And that's why on an OB ultrasound, you'll have a stomach bubble with fluid. You'll have fluid in your bowel because the lower esophagus is attached to the trachea. And when they breathe in the amniotic fluid, fluid gets into the belly. If it's the other type that there's both ends blindly, there's gonna be a gasless abdomen. Or if the, the rarer type, when the upper esophagus connects to the trachea, but the lower esophagus is blind, a gasless abdomen. But so that's, and then they're gonna go do a renal ultrasound because the R stands for renal. They're gonna look for kidney problems, horseshoe kidneys, heterotopia, uh, absent kidneys, anything, pelvic kidneys. And then L stands for limb. Often the radius and the thumb might be absent or hypoplastic. So all that, can happen, all of that can happen just because I saw an abnormality or we saw an abnormality on the vertebral bodies. And that is not that uncommon. This is one that comes in the clinic and it says cough, and this is one you go crap. You literally go crap, because if you look, here's a healing rib fracture, here's a healing rib fracture, healing, 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 healing rib fractures. Posterior rib fractures are very suspicious for child abuse, very suspicious. Uh, fractures at different stages of healing, very suspicious for child abuse. When you see this, they're going to get a skeletal survey. You have to get a skeletal survey. I hate those, but you have to. And the most pathognomonic, pathognomonic means as close to 100% as possible, 
is this, a metaphyseal corner fracture. This is a bucket handle fracture of the distal tibia. The most common metaphyseal corner fractures are going to be at the knees and the ankles because they usually grab the legs and twist and yank. Okay, so this is, you got to be careful about periosteal reaction. If this kid is 30 days to six months of life, that's normal. If this kid is less than 30 days of age, that's abnormal. If the kid is over six months of age, it's abnormal. If the most common fractures you're going to see are long bone fractures, but they're not very specific. If the kid's a, a six week old and they have a femur fracture, you better have a really good explanation of what happened. You know, the kid was on the ground and I literally tripped over a, my dog and f my knee landed right on his femur. Because six months old don't, six weeks old don't move. So they cannot break their femur. So that really puts a flag in the ER doctor and the pediatrician. Child abuse, you need to always worry about that. And we, we would call this consistent with, I would say this is very consistent with non-accidental trauma. I didn't say who did it. I just said that this kid was abused. If you have a patient with hip pain, if you call me and tell me this kid has right here, every time they move this kid's leg, he cries and he's, he's uh, like six months old or 12 months old, I would say a septic hip because the odds are it's a septic hip. If you told me he's a five-year-old male, I would say leg cap perthes, which is avascular necrosis. This is leg cap perthes. If you told me he is a 13-year-old obese child, I would say skiffy, just because of the ages. Here in leg calf perthes disease, which is avascular necrosis of the femoral head, the earliest change in AVN is you get a little soft tissue swelling, but it's so hard to see soft tissue swelling in hips. Uh, so that, you might not see it. Then the next change is the head, the femoral head will get more dense, more white, and a little bit smaller than the other one. Look at this, this is normal, this is white. When you start getting this fragmentation, this black line under the cortex and some fragmentation, that's advanced. Even the whiteness is not acute. If, if you suspect AVN, p students in uh, ER, you suspect AVN, you get a plain film as normal, but you really think, it, order an MRI if that's going to matter, if it's going to change something, because MRI will show you the abnormal marrow, the abnormal head way before the plain film shows it. You got to realize, that's why if you have a cancer patient and you're worried about bone metastasis, you order a nuclear medicine bone scan. You can't really order a bone scan for multiple myeloma, you have to order the bone survey. But bone scans for breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, that will show you metastasis way before the plain film will. They, you have to lose 40% of your bone for it to show up on an x-ray. 40%. So before 40%, the x-ray is normal. And yet he could have a rip-roaring uh, metastasis. Let's say it was right here. She had a breast cancer. She has mid-arm pain. You only order a humus x-ray. We said normal. She comes back a year later, has a moth-eaten thing and pathologic fracture. You could have saved her that last year by doing a bone scan, finding it, and then radiating it or do whatever you do to it. And maybe she would not have had that pathologic fracture. But this is leg calf perthes. Five, six, seven, eight-year-old males, four to five times more common than females, as opposed to this condition which is 12, 13, 14 year old, obese teenagers, pre-teenagers, males minimally more prominent than females, so almost equal. And this is called slip capital femoral epiphysis. The best view to see this is a frog leg lateral view. What you can do here is you can draw your line down, the, down up the femoral neck and it should hit about that much of the head. Here you draw your line up here, it barely touches that femoral head. That femoral head will slip posterior medial. You can see that this is slipped. This is not slipped, this is perfect, that's the fovea. This is not slip, this one is slip. It goes posterior immediately. This is skiffy, this is important in the ER and for you students. You see this, you call ortho and they, they admit the kid because they're gonna do that night or tomorrow, they're gonna put a screw through here and fix this head at whatever degree of slippage it is. I've seen them reduce two of them and both get AVN. They could still get AVN with it, with this, but you're much more risk of getting AVN if you reduce it. So if you say, if you guys see it and you say, you got skiffy, I'm gonna get you an appointment in two weeks. The kid goes home and still walks on it, it's gonna slip more and more and more and more and more. The more it slips, the worse prognosis. <clears throat> Fractures, I always tell, uh, rub your finger on here. I don't literally mean rub your finger on here. Just put your eyes up here, rub, smooth, 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 smooth. There's a splinter. I got a splinter right here because there's an interruption in the cortex. And then when you get real close, you can see that this fracture is kind of coming like this. And there's a black line going all the way here. This is a Salter Harris 4 fracture. Salter Harris fractures involve the growth plate. This is called the epiphysis. This is called the physis or epiphyseal plate. This is called the metaphysis. This is called the diaphysis. A Salter Harris fracture has to involve the growth plate. If it doesn't involve the growth plate, it's not a Salter Harris fracture. But Salter Harris 1 is a skiffy. Skiffy, that last one we saw, slippage, 
That's the salt air is one. Salt air is two is a fracture through the metaphysis into the growth plate. Salt air is three is a fracture through the epiphysis into the growth plate. Salt air is four is a fracture through the metaphysis, the growth plate, and the epiphysis. And that has a variant called a triplane when it goes, bless you, through the metaphysis, scoots across the growth plate, and then goes through the epiphysis. It's called a triplane fracture. That's a four. A five is a crush injury. The fours and fives are bad. Threes are bad because threes are bad because it is not only involved the growth plate, but it also involved the articular surface. The bad thing about Salter Harris fractures are this fracture might heal by having this growth, this growth plate fuse early. So that means that this bone might be a little shorter than the other side. And so you got to just realize that that's the, that's the potential. Here's a soft tissue lateral neck. Uh, you know that children can get things called pseudo-subluxation of childhood when, especially if the head's flexed, when C2 looks sublux on C3, which looks sublux on C4, which can look sublux on C5, but these posterior, uh, these posterior spinous processes should all be intact. That you know the pre-dental space in a kid can be up to five millimeters in an adult, 2.5 to three. This is the oral pharynx, this is the nasal pharynx, this is where the adenoids live, this is the hard palate, the soft palate. This is the voleculi, this is the piriform sinus. This black area in the middle of the black is the level of the true cords. So when we do a swallowing study, if, they, if it goes to here, we call that deep laryngeal penetration. If it goes below this, we call it aspiration. This is the hyoid bone. This is the area epiglottic fold. This is the epiglottis. This is a coin that gets stuck in the neck. This was acute sinusitis, but you don't need to do it. But this is what you would look for in acute sinusitis. You would look for an air fluid level. Most of the time when we see an air fluid level, it's not because they worry about acute sinusitis. It was because of trauma. And for some reason, they got a, a sinus series or a facial series, and you got to really look for orbital floor blowout fracture. This is the medial wall of the orbit. It's called the lamina papyrisia, which means paper thin. Now, why, if that is paper thin, do we mostly get a blowout fracture involved in the floor, which is not paper thin? The floor of the orbit is not paper thin. It's because this, these are the ethmoid air cells. They're a bunch of little honeycomb looking cells, kind of acts like a shock absorber. You can get a medial blowout, yes, you can but you're much more gonna get a blow up fracture of the floor. The pressure comes here, that thing acts like a shock absorber, and then here, it's just a big cavity below it, nothing to stop it. So it's kind of like if you have a real piece, uh, piece of plywood, and, there, and then that's on your floor, you're covering a hole in your floor, and you're on the second floor, and I walk on it, I jump on it, there's no resistance there. I'm gonna go right through that plywood and go all the way down. That's what the force does, hits this, breaks it, and goes down in here, and that would be an air blood level. And oftentimes you'll see a little glob of blood or the inferior rectus or uh, orbital fat dipping down into there. This is where uh, the nasal septum, look to make sure the nasal septum is not deviated. For epiglottitis versus croup, you know that the classic is the steeple sign is croup, which is usually peri-influenza virus, which is a virus, low-grade fever, barking cough at night. Epiglottitis, usually H flu, but it can be other bacterial, it can either be viral. But the, th the thumb sign, the thickened area epiglottic fold in the epiglottis, uh, this hypopharynx should be very distended in, in uh, epiglottitis. On a lateral view of croup, this would not be as distended, and the, this part of the trachea will be narrowed. It will be subglottic stenosis from edema. Ultrasound, we use ultrasound. Uh, especially look pyloric stenosis, uh, non-bilious vomiting. Uh, you, classic is the firstborn male. You know, they're six, seven, eight weeks old. Uh, projectile vomiting. We, we use it for ascites, pleural effusions. We use ultrasound for abdominal pain, pelvic pain, or polycystic ovarian syndrome. We do it for UTI workup for suspected hydronephrosis. We do a lot of newborns in the newborn nursery because they had an abnormal prenatal ultrasound. Testicular pain, this is the best study for torsion or epididymitis, epididymorchitis. For testicular pain or swelling, to rule out a hydrocele versus a hernia. And the best person at doing that is Dr. Simoncini by far. By far. Palpable masses, you feel a mass, we just did one today. Huge mass in here that just, there were so many lymph nodes you couldn't even count them. But the, it, they, they, the clinician wants to know, is there a drainable abscess? And so there was no abscess, but these are lymph nodes versus abscess. In premature infants, we use the anterior fontanelle. The anterior fontanelle closes between six months of age and 18 months of age, and we use that as a window. Ultrasound can't go through bone, so we can't go through this once the baby's fontanelles are closed and the sutures are closed. The posterior fontanelle closes by three months of age. So we look at that for, because these little babies are premature. They're under a lot of stress. Their blood vessels, especially in the germinal matrix, are immature. They don't have nice linings, epithelial linings and stuff, and they'll bleed. They'll get head bleeds. 
And if you've got a lower extremity swelling and you want to roll out DVT, thank God for ultrasound and color Doppler. Thank God. You guys don't know what we used to do. Did you ever do venograms? Oh, you are lucky. A venogram, would, we, we, first of all, the foot is all swollen, but you've got to get an IV into that foot, into that vein. And then they're going to be standing on a wooden block, standing on their good leg, and the, the bad leg is hanging down here. And you are going under fluoroscopy, and you're x-raying. And as you inject, and you have, band, you have a rubber band around here, or not a rubber band, but a, a tourniquet here, a tourniquet here, because you're trying to force it into the deep vessels. And you, you take images with them straight and then oblique, and then you go back up and go higher and higher, and then you release it. And Oh, it was terrible. Just have you ever done a lymphangiogram? Oh, my god. Now you're trying to get into a little duct jewel, a little, a little duct, uh, 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 lymphatic duct. That is horrible. You inject contrast into the swollen foot between the web spaces, and you look to see if when the lymphatics pick it up, and you try to put a needle in it. Oh, my god. That could take you all day long. But ultrasound is oh, DVT ultrasound. This is what pyloric stenosis will look like. This is the stomach. This is the pylorus. Usually, guys, you can go, the second you walk in there and you see it, you know it's positive or negative. If you see this huge, thick muscle that's more than 3.5 millimeters, we used to use 4 millimeters, it should be under 3. They're almost always like 2, 2.5, 2.8. should be under 3. 3 to 3.5 is borderline. Over 3.5 is abnormal. That's what we use here. 3.5 and over are abnormal. We need to tell our text, don't, don't take a measurement that says 4.5 if you see fluid and gas flying through there. If you have pyloric stenosis, you can't get fluid and gas passing through there. You gotta be real careful. If this length is over 1.5 centimeters is abnormal, you still use 1.75. Under 1 1.4 is normal. Usually it's about 1, 1 1.2. Under 1 1.4 is normal centimeters, not millimeters. Over 1.5 centimeters is abnormal. If you see fluid passing through there and they get a measurement of 1.9 or two, probably the antrum has collapsed and they're measuring not only the pylorus but the antrum. So that's when you give them Pedialyte. Don't let them take measurements that are abnormal, okay? D delete those images because if you, if you say this is 1.75 and yet I saw this did not look thick and I saw fluid going through here, that's a technical error, okay? So again, over 1.5 centimeters in length, abnormal. Under 1.4, normal. 1.4 to 1.5, borderline. Muscle wall thickness over 3.5, abnormal. Under 3, normal. 3 to 3.5, borderline. I've had one that was normal on Friday, and I told him if the kid continues throwing up, we'll just bring him back. Monday, we brought him back. It was positive. The, the, it'll get, if they have pylor, hypertrophic pyloristosis, it's going to get thicker, thicker, and thicker. Sometimes they'll, you'll do it, and they'll say, I really suspect it. That's when you do the upper GI. You don't start with an upper GI for pyloric stenosis. You start with an ultrasound, no radiation. Okay, if you borderline and they really suspect it, you can do an upper GI and look for the string sign and stuff. The ER, make sure their electrolytes are okay. This is not an emergency study. We'll do it in the middle of the night because we're just nice and we have a resident here and we call the tech in and the patients live far away. It's not an emergency. Your electrolytes could kill the patient. Metabolic hypokalemic uh, alkalosis, that can kill the patient. You need to correct that. That's the emergency. We will do the ultrasound in the middle of the night. Residents, if it's like two in the morning, or they're already gonna, they're gonna admit the kid no matter what, say, can we do it first thing in the morning? I promise you the techs get here like at 6.45, 7 o'clock. They will do it. They can do it then. And then that will save you having to call them in and, and do it. Or if I'm here, just say Dr. Gates will be here first thing in the morning, because you know what time I get here early. And we'll do it then, I'll do it then. But if it's like at nine o'clock at night and they say, well, if it's normal, I'm letting the baby go home, then you're gonna have to do it. Don't be mean to pediatricians. Uh, they're nice people, okay? They're really nice people. They're, they're trying their best. Uh, we can, I know you guys, you, you guys are gonna be horribly busy on call, but if the kid lives a far away, you know, think about it if it was you. Just sometimes that's the best way to think. Think if it was my kid, would I wanna go home and then have to come back? No, you wouldn't. You'd appreciate it if they did it. So j even though it's really not an emergency, try to do it, and I know that it's, it's tough when you're, you're getting slammed. But the good thing is, you don't get slammed that as, Tom, you don't get slammed as often as you did last year. Second year's worst year of radiology. So first year's study. This is your time to study, to learn how to do everything, to learn all your anatomy and what's normal, what's not normal, and to enjoy your weekends, except if you're on interventional. Because next year, every time you turn around, it's gonna be a weekend. Polycystic ovarian syndrome. 
Think of me. I think I have it. I'm fat. I'm obese. I'm hairy. Hirsutism. When I was a kid, I had acne. I've never had a period. So that is, that is students, that is the classic polycystic ovarian syndrome. If on your boards, that's probably what it's going to say. They're going to give you that. Polycystic ovarian, there are many, when I give this lecture afterwards, this thin, non-hairy, non-obese, uh, no acne woman will come up and say, I have it. So that's just kind of like, you know, the, the textbook, but diseases don't follow textbook a lot. So the problem with this is, if they are heavy, and the, the woman, the, our, I really believe that our techs do their best to not do intervaginals. I think they go to you like this. Do you want me to stick this in your vagina? <laughs> and, the, and, the, and it's bigger, than, a little bit bigger, and the girl says no, and they go, okay. Patient, not sexually active, to, refuses, and they put that on the, on the, the, the little thing. Because, let me tell you why for polycystic ovarian syndrome you need it. Uh, ultrasound hates fat people. CT loves fat people unless you're too fat for the table limit, because the reason there's a weight limit is because that table is going in millimeters. It is exact. It has to be exact. Millimeters, you know, moving and everything, it's exact. You break the ball bearing system, you've ruined the table. Uh, the gantry, if you're too big to fit in the gantry, you can't have a CT. But if you can fit in the gantry, you don't weigh as much as the table limit, oh, the, the radiologist will love you, because especially the body people, because fat separates all the organs out. Now we get all these different organs. And fat, when you get a demon, the fat is so easy to see. You do a brand new baby's CT, it's just, the, it's a mush work. Everything, you can't see the damn pancreas. The bowel is all, it's hard, hard, hard to see. So you're, we're trying to go through an obese person, transabdominal, which we use the bladder as a window, but you have to go through a lot of fat through the bladder. This girl, her ovaries were normal on uh, transabdominal. We do intervaginal. This is what you're looking for. Polycystic ovarian syndrome are not multiple cysts. They're multiple little follicles, more than 13 or 14 of them, around the periphery of both ovaries. It looks like the old rotary dial phone. This is the pathognomonic finding for polycystic ovarian syndrome. You can't see these little follicles on an obese girl transabdominally. You need to do intervaginally. So really, we do transabdominal. We, don't, we say normal transabdominal pelvic ultrasound doesn't rule it out. They need to do the intervaginal. Now, if the girl is totally refusing, that's her prerogative. We cannot make her. But if you as clinicians can tell her ahead of time, it is very important that when they ask you that you let them do it because it will show your ovaries so much better. You put it in their vagina, now you're this close to the ovaries as opposed to that close to the ovaries. Here, you, okay, I'm delivering a baby. Delivering a baby, shoulder out, pull the head up, the other shoulder out. You catch it, you put it over in the chicken lights. You cut the cord, clamp the cord, cut the cord, put it under the chicken lamp. You feel the belly, and you go, man, there's a mass in this baby. The number one differential diagnosis is hydronephrosis. The number two is multi-cystic dysplastic kidney. Number three is neuroblastoma. So the most common palpable abdominal mass in a newborn is neuroblastoma, solid, palpable solid mass. The most common palpable mass is hydronephrosis followed by this. Multi-cystic dysplastic kidney. What they believe this is due to is an in utero insult on the ureter or the renal pelvis. So they get blockage. They, they scar down the ureter and they get massive hydronephrosis. It gets massiver and massiver and just huge. And then they pinch off. And now what you have is a non-functioning kidney that has very, cysts of various sizes that do not communicate, Jared. Not pointing you out, just saw you there. They don't communicate. If they, com if they communicate, it's high dinephrosis and you can save that kidney. Maybe they can do a nephrostomy. If they do not communicate, that kidney is non-functioning. It won't be working. They'll leave it alone as long as it's not infected. And sooner or later, it'll shrink down and shrink and shrink and shrink. We have to know about this because this has a high association with a contralateral what? UPJ stenosis. Contralateral UPJ stenosis. <laughs> They can be bilateral multi-cystic spastic kidneys. That baby in utero will have been oligohydramnios. If you have a baby that's born and they do, and you do a chest x-ray and they have a bell-shaped small chest with bilateral pneumothoraces, you've got to worry that the kid doesn't have kidneys or that there was a posterior valve and he wasn't making, he couldn't get, let the urine go out because it was oligo because the babies need to have that amniotic fluid to help mature their lungs. So if you have bilateral multi-cystic spastic kidney, you do, an OB, you do an OB ultrasound, you will see no bladder. There'll be no fluid in the bladder. You will have severe oligohydramnios. The baby will come out, you'll do it, see it bilateral, the baby will die usually within 24 hours because they don't make urine. 
So multi-cystic spines again, if they're bilateral, they're dead. Here, this is not one that you're normally going to see, but I would happen to be up in the PICU at the time or the NICU. These little white things were little white bubbles, and you could just see them flying through here, just flying. This was portal venous gas. You know, of course, the, we, you don't do this to check for you do the, the plain film, but if you're up there, you might see little white, if you see little white bubbles moving, kind of like the cardiologists do, you know, when they shake that up to see for the heart, they shake the little micro, micro bubbles. They're looking for those little white little dots. This is testicle. This is the normal test. It's so important first years. First years, you need to go, when you're on call, try to go down as many ultrasounds as you can, especially a testicle to look for where it is. Uh, uh, for the ovaries, for real ectopic, you better be in that room. Don't trust the text. There's some real good ones. There's some that are not so good. Uh, this is so important. Uh, you need to know what side is, is abnormal. They hurt on what side, and you should start on the normal side, so get a good idea what normal looks like. This is the normal testicle. This is the normal vascularity. This is a great ball of fire, literally a great ball of fire. This is epididymal orchitis. Here's the epididymis. That thing is really hypervascular, and look at the testicle. That thing is on fire compared to this. This is epididymal orchitis. Uh, torsion can be tricky if, it's, if it torses and detorses, torses and detorses. That's why really any patient that comes to the emergency room, you really should consult urology. Let them get a good feel also. Uh, because it, what if, if they torse and detorse and we do the ultrasound and they had detorse and we call it normal? but maybe they feel it, they can play with the ball, the testicle, and maybe feel, say, this is on a bell clapper, this is a bell clapper deformity, or something. They might be able to feel something and then know better, but better than we do. Maybe you're an expert at this and you're, you're an ER urology specialist, which would be great. But you, the fir if, if you have vascular flow in a torus testicle, the earliest loss will be of the venous system, and then you'll lose the arterial system. You can have a lot of vessels around the testicle and it'll still be torse. You just shouldn't see it in the testicle. But just please be careful about that bell clapper. We had a bell clapper last month. And the reason I knew it was a bell, I remember that, there was fluid all around the testicle. You could see fluid all around, the, you, all we had was the spermatic cord and there's the testicle. And every image showed fluid around the testicle. That is a bell clapper that it should be attached over there. It should be, one side should be attached. This thing, nothing to stop it from torsing. Here is a ventricular ultrasound. This is the sagittal. This is the coronal. The head and face would be out here, out to you. The back would be inside the top, the bottom, the right, and the left. And this is the front, back, top, bottom. This is the head of the caudate. This is the thalamus. This is where the corpus callosum is. This is the caudothalamic notch. Caudothalamic notch. This is where a grade one germinal matrix hemorrhage would be. A round ball right here would be a grade one germinal matrix hemorrhage. This is the quarry plexus. The quarry plexus lives in the roof of the third ventricle, goes through the foramen of Monroe, then goes immediately back along the floor of the lateral ventricle of the body, goes into the atrium or the trigone. It's called atrium or trigone because the body, the occipital horn and the temporal horn meet, and then it goes into the temporal horn. It does not go back here in the occipital horn. It does not go anterior to here. So this looks exactly like that. There's no difference between that and that. The only thing is, quarry plexus doesn't live here, so that can't be quarry plexus. That's blood. That is blood. And in this case, this would be a grade two. When it bleeds into the ventricle and the ventricle is not dilated, that's grade two. Grade one is the germinal matrix hemorrhage. Grade two is bleeding in the ventricle, not dilated. Grade three is when the blood caused hydrocephalus. So you can have mild grade three with mild hydrocephalus, or you can have severe grade three with marked hydrocephalus. And then grade four is when it bleeds into the brain parenchyma. Three and four are bad, one and two are not so bad. Uh, you, if you have grade two hemorrhage and then you do a follow-up in a month, and now you have hydrocephalus, but you really don't have any more blood, that's not considered grade three. It's grade two hemorrhage with obstructive hydrocephalus. This little piece of blood probably blocked off the foramen of Monroe, and that's what's causing the hydrocephalus. The grade three has to be because the blood caused the hydrocephalus. It made it big. So they had to re-bleed to make it get bigger or more blood. We've got almost five minutes. I'll do CT real quick. CT is awesome for trauma congenital abnormalities, infections, and tumors. Here is an orbit hanging backwards. There's no optic nerve, of course, the guy he was at. This guy came in with a, his eye in a cup. They can't save it, but all kinds of fractures. CT is great for that. CT, you gotta realize, this is a BB. It's helpful, but 
you know, they would not do a uh, MRI in this because this thing might move and then cause blindness. But it, it's hard to tell exactly where this BB is because of this artifact, metal artifact, but it looks like it could be near that, glo that orbit, that, the globe. Here is a tension pneumothorax. You would never do a CT for a tension pneumothorax. You do a chest X-ray, but this patient had chest X-ray. This is a shift of the heart away. This is way down, severe collapsed lung. Uh, if I went down lower, the diaphragm would be real low. Uh, for a neck abscess, you can do a, a lateral view of the, of the soft tissue neck. Look for pre soft tissue swelling. Kids often have a big swelling. When Before Dr. Odita died, I said, Dr. Odita, how do you tell? He said, you know how you have your piriform sinus come like that, causes a little black notch, and then you have your area of the glottic fold? If that black notch is a face, then he's really worried about pre soft tissue swelling. But if you suspect a, if you suspect clinically a retropharyngeal abscess, do a CT. And this black is the fluid. This black is the abscess. That's the abscess. For CT, for brain, for uh, acute headache, rule out bleed. Uh, chronic headache would probably be better to start with an MRI. Chronic. If you had, if I hit you in the head three months ago and you're still having headaches, probably best to start off with an MRI. Chronic trauma is better MRI. Acute trauma by far is CT. You do a CT. Well, this kid had headaches, they did a CT because CT is so fast. Children, yet they realized they have to sedate them for these exams, so they prefer CT even though it's radiation because they don't have to sedate them very long. It goes, well, this was a huge posterior fossa midline mass. There's no contrast. This is a hyperattenuated mass with areas of necrosis in the midline in the region of the cerebellum. This is a medulloblastoma causing obstructive hydrocephalus. Third ventricle, Freeman and Monroe, frontal horns of the lateral ventricles. Here is a Wilms tumor. Uh, you, here you would not know if that's a Wilms tumor. You, it could be a retropharyngeal, uh, retroperitoneal tumor, uh, uh, liposarcoma, all the other the different types, because you don't really know if it's coming from the kidney. But here you have now a beak sign, so you know here that this is coming from the kidney. It's a Wilms tumor. We always have to differentiate Wilms tumor from neuroblastoma. This is my last slide. Neuroblastoma is usually in the adrenal. The best prognosis for, for neuroblastoma is if your child is less than one year of age and it's in the adrenal. If it's out of the adrenal or greater than a year of age, the patient, worse prognosis. Wilms is usually always in the kidney. Dr. Heldman had a Wilms that came from the bladder. Uh, neuroblastoma would be rare in the kidney, but it could happen. Neuroblastoma can be anywhere in the sympathetic ganglion. It could be at the organ of Zucker candle. You remember that term, organ of Zucker candle, like right below the IMA in uh, takeoff? So uh, neuroblastoma is usually in the adrenal, Wilms tumor in the kidney. I told you about the best prognosis. Wilms tumor is between ages one and eight. It's rare in an infant. Infant is less than one year. Newborn's less than 30 days. Wilms is rare in an infant. Rare means it happens, but not often. Classic is a two or three year old mom giving the baby a bath feels a mass. That's classic. But one to eight years old is a Wilms tumor. After eight years old, you would think uh, uh, renal cell carcinoma. Calcifications love to calcify neuroblastoma up to 70%, Wilms about 10%. The calcifications in here are going to be stippled, and here they're going to be curvilinear. But if you see a calcified mass and you just don't know where it's coming from, it's more likely to be a neuroblastoma. Bilateral 10%, bilateral less than 10%. This thing will cross the midline in more than half. This will may cross the midline, usually doesn't. Uh, renal vein, the neuroblastoma is coming from the adrenal. It encases the renal vein, it encases the IVC. Wilms tumor is coming from the kidney. It grows into the renal vein and then into the inferior vena cava and can go up into the right atrium, can go into the right ventricle, go into the pulmonary artery. So it invades. Metastasis, neuroblastoma's favorite place to go is the bone, then the lymph nodes, then the liver, and lastly, the lung. Wilms tumor's favorite place to go is the lung. So on Wilms follow, they always get a chest x-ray. Uh, neuroblastoma, bone is where it loves to go. Uh, so Wilms, lung, then liver. If you, uh, associations, they're associated with neuroblastoma, congenital heart defects, egg gangliosis of the bowel. Wilms is associated with beckwith wiedemann the big tongue, the big spleen, hemihypertrophy, sporadic aniridia, renal or genital anomalies, horseshoe kidneys, uh, hemihypertrophy, I told you about that. Wilms is also called nephroblastoma. That's another name for it. Nephroblastomatosis is in an infant that has more than one mass in the kidney, and that's a precursor to Wilms. So be careful when you say nephroblastoma because that is Wilms. Nephroblastosis, nephroblastomatosis is a precursor to Wilms. The most common solid renal mass in a newborn is mesoblastic nephroma, which is a benign tumor, but kind of like any tumor in the kidneys, any solid mass comes out, kind of like any solid mass in the testicle. If you have a testicular mass, it's cancer until you prove it's not. If it's outside the testicles, it's benign, usually. 
Neuroblastoma will have this VMA elevated in the urine, 95%. So you do a urine thing. You can do a uh, MIBG study to look for this. Uh, if it metastasizes to the skin, it's called the blueberry muffin syndrome. And I'll start with MRI next time. So uh, this I know is a crap load of information that I just went over. I will go over each different section at different months. And so you're going to hear a lot of this again, but it might be months from now on whatever section it was. But just the, the sad thing about peds is on the boards, everything, okay, the, the way the board is, you should have three sections. You should have adult, peds, and IR. That should be all there is. Because in adults, they break it down into MSK, into chest, into uh, uh, GI, into GU. You see what I'm saying? Oh, Newt Med should be their own section. Newt Med should be an own section. But peds, they lump it all together. So everything is in peds, and that's why on the in-service, our residents usually don't do too well in peds, especially the urine work, because everything is on peds, and sometimes they had not even had peds yet. But, uh, oh, and MAMO should be another section. So there's more, but, but I'm just, there's not as many as there are in, in, adult, in adults. They break it down in everything. <laughs>